God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. And I will seek you in the morning and learn to walk in your ways. Step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days. From the educated to the uneducated, from children to grown-ups, we all quarrel. It may be intense or it may be mild, but have you listened to the kind of things people are saying? That's my spot. This is my country. He's touching me. You cut me off. My view is right and yours is wrong. If you do that, we will go to war against you. She stole my cookie. I want a party. Me, 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 mine, 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 now, now, now. Interestingly enough, the person who makes any of these statements, or a zillion others, isn't just saying that the other person's behavior bothers them. They are appealing to some standard of behavior which they expect the other person or persons to know about. It is rare for the other to say, to hell with your standard. Rather, more typically, the other person comes up with a reason, a justification, for why it was okay in this particular case to take those actions, do that deed, say those words. In short, humans don't typically challenge that there is a right and wrong. Rather, we justify why we did what was not wrong at the time. God to Adam. Did you do what I asked you not to do? Adam, the woman who you gave me did this. God to Eve. What have you done? Eve, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, whether you accept their story as literal or figurative, rationally, we simply have to admit that all humans, including ourselves, hold a pretty specific set of universally understood standards and are somehow prone to violate those standards and then justify our actions. It could easily be called hiding from understood responsibility and blaming something or someone else, as that's what it amounts to anyway. Something turned up which lets me off keeping my promise or doing what is understood to be right, etc., etc. Whatever we suppose their origin to be, it appears that there are universally understood dictates of right and wrong sometimes called common sense, which are meant to steer mankind clear from error, enabling us to judge between true and false. And it works for the most part until someone doesn't get their way. <clears throat> so it looks very much like both parties in any argument have in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decency or morality or whatever you like to call it. If they didn't, they might still fight with each other like the animals do, but they would not quarrel in the human sense based on who is right and who has or hasn't done wrong. The very purpose of quarreling is to show that the others are in the wrong. There would be no sense in this sort of human behavior if there were not a commonly held sense of right and wrong. We humans even make this kind of thing up for our games and other activities. A referee can hardly call a foul if there isn't a recognized rule of the game which has been broken. It even extends to things we all generally agree are cool, like watching Andrew do tricks on his skateboard. Something, some inner and commonly held sense defines what is cool and what is not. 
This inner sense of right and wrong has been called the law of nature. However, the law of nature is really just a description of what nature does. A dropped rock falls due to, the, due to gravity, but the rock had no choice in the matter. So it is not really a law, but a description of how the nature of drop rocks and gravity work together. All manner of animals, creatures, and what we consider lower forms of life generally do what they do based on the law of nature, forces or instincts which describe what they do. When we see a lion hunting, killing, and eating another animal, we're not observing moral decisions based on right and wrong but are merely observing what lions do. So we need another name for what humans do. Let's just call it the law of human nature, because what we find is that mankind has the, this in, inherent understanding of right and wrong, present even in infancy, though dawning more as we mature. Sure, there might be the odd individual who doesn't know it, just as there are some people who are colorblind or tone deaf. However, taken as a whole, the race of mankind has a sense of what constitutes decent behavior, which is obvious to everyone. It is true that different civilizations and different ages of mankind have had somewhat different moralities and certainly different laws and rules to fit their times and understanding. But the baseline differences are actually pretty slight. We don't typically find historic nations where men are praised for running away from battle, or people were proud of those who double-crossed the people who, who were kindest to them. There have been differences in loyalties, but selfishness and taking advantage over others has never been admired. Men have differed on whether to have one wife or many, but the concept of this is mine, not yours, has always been along with many other understandings. In mankind's case, this law of human nature or right and wrong is above and beyond the, the actual facts of human behavior. It is a real law which we did not invent and yet intuitively, consciously, conscientiously know that we ought to obey. It actually constitutes our sense of the right way to live with one another fair play, or shall we say, how humans ought to behave. Remarkably, you might find a person who says they don't believe in right and wrong and who breaks their promises at a whim. But if you break a promise to them, what do they say? That's unfair. Nations do this with treaties all the time. They can say that past treaties don't matter, but when they go to break one, there's always a justification. Why justify what didn't matter? So, as rational people, we are forced to admit, like it or not, that there is such a thing as right and wrong. People can be mistaken about the details, just like getting a number wrong when balancing your finances. But we find that right and wrong are not merely matters of taste or opinion any more than the multiplication table. With this as our first point, that a universally understood sense, not details, of right and wrong does exist within the human race as a whole, then we can go on to the next point. And that point is that none of us, speaking of mankind historically or currently, have really or are really fully keeping this law of human nature. We all know what we ought to do and how we ought to behave but quite often we justify not doing so. It is hard for me to imagine that you would consider yourself to be an exception to this. For me, 48 plus years of following Jesus has brought many good and great changes into my life. Much darkness has been dispelled, much light has been installed and is shining. Yet, along with the Apostle Paul, the following statement is mine as well from Philippians chapter 3, which says, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
I will be continuing my journey of personal growth and development throughout my entire life. This has been and continues to be a realignment of myself with God. So much more than merely gaining the ability to behave more closely to what I, I know I ought to, though that is included in the package. None of us fully escapes the human condition, this side of heaven. Therefore, the same apostle urges us again from the same letter. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others, others better than himself. I know each one of you, and I see many ways in which each of you have been and continue to be better people than myself. In fact, I rejoice in this. What true father would not? So I would have you understand that I, I'm not talking about a way in which we or I become better than others. Rather, I am putting forth the truth that an extension of the universal truth of right and wrong is the observation that as humans, it may be this year, this month, more likely this very day, we have ourselves failed to practice the kind of behavior we expect from other people. Oh, we have our excuses. I snapped at the kids because I was tired. Yeah, I took advantage of a shady deal because I was hard up for cash. And what I promised so-and-so that I would do, well, I never would have promised if I had known how busy I was going to be. Or even that I do to them because of what they did to me. Regardless of knowing this truth, should someone point out that I am not keeping the law of human nature very well, that I am somehow in the wrong, then automatically, in that instant, a string of excuses pop into mind. Hopefully in that moment, I have the wisdom and maturity to know how to respond well. This internal interaction is just one more proof of how deeply we do believe in right and wrong. If we did not, then why the excuses? Why the feelings of guilt when we know internally that we have not behaved decently? We actually feel this rule of law, can't bear that we have broken it, and so make excuses. Our good temper is because we are good people, but our bad temper is because... Well, we were tired at the time. When humans are challenged, we often reply, I don't know what you're talking about. Generally, this is simple self-protection because we know our thoughts to be private and there are layers we won't or don't divulge due to the sense need for self-protection and our sense of self before others. Perhaps reputation or false reputation is felt to be at stake. All humans do this. It may be one thing to have no guile, but to be 100% transparent is a stage most of us never attain, though it can be mastered to a large extent once we know the answer to the existential questions of life. Who am I? Why are we here? What is this life all about? These two things brought together in summary make one point together, that human beings everywhere and in all times have a curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain ways and that they don't in fact consistently behave in these ways. We know the law of human nature and yet we break it. This actually presents a foundation for all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe in which we live. The apostle puts it like this when comparing the Gentiles or nations to the Jews who have received moral law directly from God, from Romans chapter 2. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having a law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Additionally curious, in general we find an inordinate longing in our souls for a corrected life experience where people behave as they ought to. Humans complain about the behaviors of others all the time, 
social media is just the new way to hide behind tool to do so. Actually, if considered, we know internally that this condition where everyone else behaves is never to be found on earth and is impossible to create among men. Science can't fix it. There's no evolutionary change or legislation which will bring it. Most people who have ever lived have some sort of background idea that when we pass on, it will be to a better life than this, inclusive of the idea that life will be more fair, more as it ought to be. These are facts about humanity, which can only be evidence and the echo of having been created by a purposeful creator who actually cares about right and wrong and somehow has set eternity in our hearts. Desires for peace on earth and harmony among mankind have not been historically fulfilled. Yet these desires are also echoes of the good or right we know we ought to embrace. Many in our day are trying to promote a new strategic belief uncommon in prior history. That if we as people and as nations meet others with fair play, then they will play fair with us. This is one of the roots behind calls for addressing the causes of poverty and so forth, rather than taking defensive and punitive actions against others who don't behave. I actually do firmly believe that Jesus calls us to compassion, to understanding, and to an extension of ourselves in and toward this world, that others may receive the benefits we have received in him. This is reflected in the second greatest commandment of God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. On the other hand, we are called to wisdom and understanding regarding human nature and how far people can or cannot be trusted. This need for awareness and protection of family and societal interest is real and is driving the, it, it is the driving force behind military strength and behind skyrocketing gun ownership, even among the guns are bad liberal communities. And so we find ourselves under a law. I have called it the law of human nature, the inner understanding of how people ought to behave. It is not binding nor expected of the lower forms of life. Though we might be able to train our pets to observe some of it, we cannot make them understand it. In addition, this law has always been, as long as humans have existed in their cognizant state upon this earth. We didn't evolve into it. We may have historically codified it, but we are not its point of origin. It is simply part of how we are put together and how we find ourselves to be. It is active even in the smallest of children before they are taught any level of conceptualization by parents or teachers and is highly reactive in regards to our sense of self. This law plays a huge role in our ability to reason and is a major clue to the meaning of the universe in which we live, that it is a structured universe, organized and imbued with intelligence on purpose and most likely for a purpose. Historically and today, most humans recognize some form of God or higher power as the author, designer, creator, originator of this universe and our race. Inclusive of our senses, our self-awareness, and our cognizance of right from wrong. Presuming upon this God or power, creative of and outside of the universe, he or it would not be perceived as one of the facts inside the universe any more than the architect of a house would be part of the house. The architect would not be one of the walls or the staircase or the fireplace in the house. The architect is outside and other than the house, the house which rather reflects and informs us quite a bit about what manner of person or power the architect really is. The architect is an influence on the house, and indeed we do find that someone or someone's external to us has indeed influenced us. We are most specifically influenced in this curious area of right and wrong, which governs in agreement or reaction, and for better or for worse, the entire flow of our lives. Further, this someone, our creator, 
Should they judge human behavior? It only makes sense to acknowledge that it would be against this common understanding of right and wrong given to us all. For those who believe in heaven with a literal angelic society before a supreme God, this general understanding of right and wrong would constitute the basis for interactions within such a society. Before moving on to look into what we can know about this someone who authored our universe and ourselves, we should take a brief look at the general views mankind holds about the universe in which we live. There are really two main views about the universe, a materialist view and what might be called a religious view. In the materialist view, presumption is made that the universe just is and for all intents and purposes always was. Through a very long chain of happenstance, our universe, galaxies, and solar systems came into being. Then life came into being. Then in a multitude of more happenstances, we finally arrive at ourselves, capable of rational thought, etc. Although those who hold this view may claim that morality or a semblance of fair play is important, they allow no basis for it. There are no real consequences in this view as long as you get away with what you choose to do and no one complains about it or you have the power to prevent those who complain from taking action against you. I'll bring up the subject of atheism a bit later on. In the religious view, presumption is made, presumption may generally be made that everything about us from macro to micro exhibits plan, purpose, and special design. In other words, a mind, will, emotions, person or persons with godlike capabilities behind it all. Of course, many variations of this view are found among the human race. Science cannot prove either view nor any subview. Science merely measures by external observation what can be observed. If science could make a complete observation and knew all knowable measures, it still could not answer this as a fundamental question in favor of one view or the other. There is, however, one thing we know more about than anything we can learn from external observation, and that thing is mankind. We don't merely observe mankind. We are men and women. We have inside, not external, information, which, if paid attention to, we can learn from. And here we learn, as previously established, that we really do find within ourselves a moral law, which we did not invent, but rather inherited or were imbued with by something or someone beyond ourselves. This law of what I ought to do, how I ought to behave versus instinct is universal. Our struggles as individuals historically and presently are caught up in dealing with what we as individuals and societies ought to do. Some have suppressed the ought to a greater degree than others. Others have tried over the centuries to legislate or command what ought to be followed, but we all know right from wrong. Nothing external to us can measure this. Externally, only behavior can be measured, and scientifically, it can only be commented upon, not judged, although from this inner morality as humans, we do make judgments. And we all struggle internally at times, even often, with how we ought to think, what we ought to do, the judgments we make and pass regarding others. Such knowledge should help us discover that we are each one among many, not truly that much different nor better than the next person. And maybe we could err more on the side of understanding and compassion for others as our default, rather than the snap judgments which seem to be the stock and trade nowadays, perhaps always have been. So we find a power behind the facts, a director, a guide, is at work and is at work. And in saying so, I have not even begun to approach the God of Christian theology, just acknowledging that there is someone behind it all with plan, purpose, and special design who definitely seems to care about what would be called right. Are there other observable clues about this someone or someone's? That's the topic of my next video.